Socrates asked uh, a priest, Euthyphro of the ancient Athenian religion, um, uh, tell me, what is it that makes something good? And, and Euthyphro answered uh, that, God, that God loves it. Uh, God, it's God's attitude, or the God's attitude, uh, that, that makes it good. And Socrates asks, um, well, does God love the good because it's good, or is his loving it what makes it good? Um, if it's the first, that God loves giving to the vulnerable, to the victims, to the orphan, to the widow, uh, because it's good, then there is something independent in virtue of which God loves these actions that makes them good, and that constitutes the reason uh, for the goodness. And if God hates genocide and loves uh, charity, uh, then there is a reason in virtue of which uh, God has these moral attitudes. And if God himself has no reason for it, if it's just whim, if it's caprice, then is that really satisfying our answer as to what makes good acts good and bad acts bad? That the addition of God doesn't ground things at all. It leaves, it, it, it makes what seems to us mysterious and answers it with another mystery. I'm really surprised to hear you trot out the old Euthyphro dilemma, because this has been answered over and over again by contemporary Christian philosophers like Robert Adams, William Alston, and others. The Euthyphro dilemma is a false dilemma. It posits two non-mutually exhaustive choices. Either the gods love something because it is good, or uh, uh, it is good and therefore they love it. The theistic alternative to the Euthyphro dilemma is that something um, is good because it is identical with God. God is the good. God is what Plato referred to as the good. Um, so that the, the reason God wills something is because he is good. And his moral commands to us reflect the goodness of his own intrinsic moral nature. God is by nature essentially kind, loving, compassionate, fair, and so forth. And this completely resolves the Euthyphro dilemma because it's a third alternative uh, to the, uh, the question. I also had an answer to your question. I had a dream. <laughs> I had a dream once and I'm speaking psychologically here, not, not theologically. I had a dream once. I was in the cemetery of an old church, an old cathedral, um, surrounded by the graves. And there were indentations in the grounds where all the graves were. And all of a sudden, the, the graves started to open. And it was a graveyard where great people, great men of the past had been buried. And so grave opened and a, an armed king stood up and then another grave opened and another armed king stood up and this happened all around me and these were very formidable figures right they were the great heroes of the past and after a number of them appeared on the scene they looked around and saw each other and being warrior types they immediately started to fight and the question is what stops the great kings of the past from fighting? And I had a revelation after the dream. I can't remember if it was part of it, but in, yes, it was part of the dream. They all bowed down to the figure of Christ. I thought, and then I woke up and I thought, what in the world does that dream mean? What in the world could that possibly mean? And then I, I, I understood it. I understood that if you have 
20 kings, let's say, and you took the thing that was most king-like about each of them and then you combined it into a single figure, then you'd get a single figure of transcendent heroism, of transcendent good. And it's a tenant of the Jungian school of psychology, let's say, that that figure of transcendent good is symbolized by the image of Christ. And the purpose of that image is so that even the tyrannical king has someone to bend his knee to. And that's absolutely vital. I mean, it does, you don't have to approach it from a religious perspective, although you inevitably do, because when you speak of things at this level, that's what happens. But you need an image of the transcendent embodied good to, to serve as something that unites the great tyrants of the past. It's something like that. It's an emergent it's an emergent vision of embodied unity. And it's a psychological necessity. It's a sociological necessity. And I think it bears very strongly on your question about why is it that people matter. It's the, the, the classic Western ad answer to that, the Judeo-Christian answer to that, is because you have a spark of divinity within you, and that divinity is a reflection of this transcendent good and it's obligatory for me to recognize that in you and vice versa if we're going to inhabit the same territory without mayhem, peacefully, and with the ability to cooperate. Now, you might say, well, the mere fact that a transcendent image is necessary as a uniting figure doesn't prove the reality of that image. But I would say, well, yes, but it doesn't disprove it, and it strongly hints at something more profound, especially when you also ally it with the observation that the encounter with something truly admirable produces the instinct of awe, and that's not a rational instinct. It's an irrational instinct, but it's a marker that you're in the presence of something greater than yourself. And it's not something that you have voluntary control over. It's something that overtakes you. And it could easily be a reflection of the truth. Now, you can make a, biological re you can make a biologically reductionistic argument about that, but it starts to become extraordinarily difficult because you, you, you enter into the realm where these transcendent experiences of religious significance and awe are a phenomenological and psychological reality. And it's not easy to explain why that's the case. So, I would just say that I'm, I'm somewhat... <laughs> same sort of social behavior exhibited by Homo sapiens is already present in their primate relatives, like yes. baboons and chimpanzees. Yes. And there is no reason to invest human morality with any more objective significance than that kind of behavior that evolution has pr programmed into other primate species because it's advantageous in the struggle but for that's survival. Not it's how just we a herd morality. Progressed. That is not how we pre progress. That's what, not what? Moral, what, what civilization is, what moral progress is. Wait, is wait, battling, where, where do you get the word battling, progress oh, yes, on I get the progress. a naturalistic worldview? I think on a naturalistic worldview, you would be justified in talking about moral change, but the word progress smuggles in yeah. yeah. a standard. Yeah. Oh! But that's because you think, that's because you think on a naturalist uh, basis, on a purely naturalist basis, uh, there is no way to justify, to ground objective morality. That's what you, True. I mean, right. C could so I? since I don't buy that premise, uh, I do think that one could talk about moral progress. Could I read you a quotation, and I want you to comment on it? Sure. Okay, and here's the question. Before you do that. We are running out of time, as All right. much as I hate to say it. So please do that. Please do that. And then I'm going to okay. ask you to each make a last statement. The scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world. The tastiness of fruit and the foulness of carrion the scariness of heights and the prettiness of flowers 
are features of our common nervous system. And if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem, or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful to us? That's a statement by Steven Pinker. <laughs> Well, 